quotes of what other people have said about ethics with respect to climate change. You've already heard a couple of them from Peter. In 1999, Clive Hamilton, a philosopher, I believe, wrote that although the problem of climate change has been and continues to be driven by the science, the international debate about how to handle the problem is fundamentally about issues of fairness. This is all about fairness, and in a minute we're going to get into the more specific issues of why this is about fairness. Lots of writers are now writing about the ethics, e ethics of climate change. Environmental philosophers, in particular, are really taking this on and are talking about a lot of the issues. <coughs> Stephen Gardner at the University of Washington has talked about climate change as a perfect moral storm. This is just a case where every imaginable different factor is coming together and raising very complicated ethical issues that we're going to be dealing with um, and trying to decide how to how to respond to climate change. Because climate change really basically is about how societal costs and benefits are distributed across people and between humans and nature. And as the climate changes, some of those costs and benefits are going to be changing. Some people are going to be much more stressed than others. And one of the real ironies of climate change, and this is the, this is really what's driving much of the ethical debate, is that those people who have contributed most to climate change are not necessarily going to be those who are most affected. In general, the people who have contributed to the problem, and we all contribute, we'll talk to, about that in a minute, but the impacts, the adverse impacts, are going to fall disproportionately on the poor in any country, but particularly on some of the least developed countries and those who have had the least to do with creating the problem itself. Um, so the, the reason climate change or ethics is important in climate change is that the way we talk about ethical decisions is going to affect the policy choices that we make. When we talk about how we want to allocate caps or, or and how we want to allocate um, emission reductions, how much we're going to ask each country to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, we're really talking about who's responsible for this and who ought to make those changes. It's really an ethical judgment that we're making there. When we talk about helping people who are vulnerable to the changes that are going to be brought about by a changing climate, and who's going to pay for injuries or to help communities adapt to climate change, when we're asking people to pay, we're beginning to talk about who's responsible and who ought to be paying the cost of, uh, of injuries relating to climate change. And some of this, by the way, goes beyond the ethical now and into the legal. There are a number of lawsuits that have been brought that are, uh, and the one that is most active right now is an island called Kivalina in northern Alaska, where a lawsuit has been brought against various power companies and others to try to recover some money because this is a community that already is suffering the effects of climate change to the effect that the whole community is going to have to be relocated. <coughs> and it's going to cost probably hundreds of millions of dollars for that to happen. The question is, who's going to bear those costs? Who should bear those costs? So the way we talk about rights and responsibilities affects the way you come up with policy options and affects the way you come up with an international agreement. Now the last one, when action should be taken, is a, another really critical issue. That deciding whether we're going to act now on climate change or whether we're going to wait has enormous intergenerational equity issues. That choosing to act now or not to act is going to affect the kind of world that our children and grandchildren grow up in. So one of the questions we're going to deal with, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is just what those of us alive today, what kind of responsibilities we have to those who are going to be living in the future. Okay. You're doing very well with this. <laughs> um, you think that I'm changing them here, but I'm not. I'm here making the change. 
So I want to talk uh, just briefly about four types of justice. This is really the, as technical as this, uh, this discussion is going to get. Um, first of all, you have the substance of justice, the substantive rights and responsibilities. Who has rights to a healthy lifestyle? Who has rights to access to food? And, uh, and what responsibilities does that trigger in other people, in their own governments or in other governments, in their families, whatever? Substantive justice generally refers to rights and responsibilities, and those are rampant in climate change. Talking about who has what right, whose responsibility, who's responsible to whom for what, are big issues. As I said before, the distribution of costs and benefits is huge in climate change. So distributive justice has to do with equity issues. It has to do with the distribution of costs and benefits across space, and that includes across nations. Sometimes benefits are here, costs are over here, sometimes they are different. We're talking about who is going to be impacted where in the world by climate change and what kinds of impacts are they going to deal with. But as I say, time is a real issue in climate change. And we're not just talking about distribution of costs among countries. We're talking about distribution of costs among generations. How much should we be paying today to protect people in the future? Or how much can we maintain our own lifestyles and allow those in the future to, to absorb costs? Climate change has to do with the distribution of costs and benefits across species. Uh, those of us who are humans, which I believe would include all of us, um, are certainly going to be impacted by climate change. But there are lots of species, the iconic polar bear is the one that's always cited, but in fact it may be less subject to extinction than many of other species. But a lot of, a, a lot of species are simply not going to be able to adjust the change of climate, even to the point of possible extinction. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, justice includes the distribution of costs and benefits of, across different wealth classes as well. And again, climate change is going to have differential effects on the wealthy who have more resources and are able to adjust much more easily than the poor who really don't have options that are going to, going to provide the protections that they need. Let me move on to procedural justice, which refers to process. What kinds of processes are we going to use to reach decisions about climate change? This has to do with who's involved in those decisions. It has to do with stakeholder involvement. And I use the term stakeholder as anyone who's going to be affected by a particular decision. That uh, if you have a stake in that decision, you are a stakeholder, and the question is, what kind of voice are you being given in the, um, in the decision? What kind of involvement do you have? If you're a tree or if you're a species that's threatened by climate change, you don't have your own voice in the decision and you need someone else to speak for you. The same is true of future generations. Uh, procedural justice has to do with how involved different stakeholders all are and whether they consent to what's being done to them. Whether they have a chance to say, okay, those greenhouse gases are going to warm the world, I'm going to have more, tr more trouble farming, that's okay. Uh, in most cases, the stakeholders in climate change have not been asked whether or not they consent to what's being done to them, or whether they have a right to object. And again, giving voice to the powerless is really important here, whether you're talking about another species, about nature in general, or people who lack political power or lack wealth. Um, mitigating circumstances are important. Excuse me. Mitigating circumstances are important in any discussion about um, justice and ethics because there are times when we excuse behavior <coughs> that we might otherwise condemn. When we say, you know, if, if you're talking about self-defense, you're allowed to harm another person.